Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are ready to continue on in our story of Farmer Boy. Remember yesterday, we left Almanzo in bed after he had just taken his weekly bath. It was Saturday night, and now it's Sunday. If you are following along in the physical copy of the book, it is page 84. If you are following along in the PDF file, the title of this chapter, which is chapter eight, is Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. When Almanzo trudged into the kitchen next morning with two brimming milk pails, mother was making stacked pancakes because this was Sunday. The big blue patter on the stove's hearse was full of plump sausage cakes. Eliza Jane was cutting apple pies and Alice was dishing up the oatmeal as usual. But the little blue patter stood hot on the back of the stove and 10 stacks of pancakes rose in tall towers on it. 10 pancakes cooked on the smoking griddle. As fast as they were done, mother added another cake to each stack and buttered it lavishly and covered it with maple syrup. Butter and sugar melted together and soaked the fluffy pancakes and dripped all down their crisp edges. That was stacked pancakes. Elmanzo liked them better than any other kind of pancakes. Mother kept on frying them till the others had eaten their oatmeal. They all ate pile after pile of them, and Almanzo was still eating when Mother pushed back her chair and said, Mercy on us! Eight o'clock, I must fly. Mother always flew. Her feet went pattering. Her hands moved as fast, and you could hardly watch them. She never sat down in the daytime except at her spinning wheel or loom, and then her hands flew and her feet tapped. The spinning wheel was a blur or the loom was clattering, thump, thud, clackety-clack. But on Sunday morning, she made everybody else hurry, too. Father curried and brushed the sleek brown driving horses till they all shone. Elmanzo dusted the sleigh and Royal wiped the silver-mounted harness. They hitched up the horses and then they went to the house to put on their Sunday clothes. Mother was in the pantry setting the top crust on the Sunday chicken pie. Three fat hens were in the pie under the bubbling gravy. Mother spread the crust and crimped the edges, and the gravy showed through the two pine trees that she had cut in the dough. She put the pie in the heating stove's oven with the beans and the Ryan engine bread. Father filled the stove with hickory logs and closed the dampers while Mother flew to lay out his clothes and dress herself. Poor people had to wear homespun clothes on Sundays, and Royal and Almanzo wore full cloth. But Father and Mother and the girls were very fine in clothes that mother had made of store bought in cloth woven by machines. She had made father's suit of fine black broadcloth. The cloth had a velvet collar and his shirt was made of French calico. His stock was black silk and on Sundays he did not wear boots. He wore shoes of thin calfskin. Mother was dressed in brown merino with a white lace collar and white lace frills at her wrists under the big bell-shaped sleeves. Merino is a kind of wool, so it comes from sheep, so it's, it's thick and it's warm. Well, actually, sorry about that. It's not really very thick. I say that, but it's not really very thick, but it is very warm. It's merino wool is what it is. She had knitted the lace of the finest threads, and it was like cobwebs. There were rows of brown velvet around her sleeves and down the front of her basque, and she had made her bonnet of the same brown velvet with brown velvet strings tied under her chin. Elmanzo was proud of Mother in her fine Sunday clothes. The girls were very fine, too, but he didn't feel the same about them. Their hoop skirts were so big that Royal and Almanzo could hardly get into the sleigh. They had to scrunch down and let those hoops bulge over their knees. And if they even moved, Eliza Drain would kind of cry out, Be careful, clumsy! And Alice would moan, Oh dear me, my ribbons are must! But when they were all tucked under the buffalo skin robes with hot bricks at their feet, Father let the prancing horses go and Almanzo forgot everything else. Why do you think they put hot bricks at their feet when they rode in the sleigh? To keep their feet warm. That's right. The sleigh went like the wind. The beautiful horses shone in the sun. Their necks were arched and their heads were up and their slender legs spurned the snowy road. 
They seem to be flying. Their glossy long manes and tails, brown, backing in the wind of the speed. I'm sorry, blown. That, no wonder that didn't make itself. Blown back in the wind of the speed. Father sat straight and proud, holding the reins and letting the horses go as fast as they would. He never used the whip. His horses were gentle and perfectly trained. He had only to tighten or slacken the reins, and they obeyed him. His horses were the best horses in New York State, or maybe in the whole world. Malone was five miles away, but Father never started till 30 minutes before church time. That team would trot the whole five miles, and he would stable them and blanket them and be on the church steps when the bell rang. Here is a picture of the church, a little church in town. Back here in the back are the stables where they keep the horses in the wintertime. Well, probably in the summertime, too, to keep them out of the heat. When Amato thought that it would be years and years before he could hold the reins and drive horses like that, he could hardly bear it. In no time at all, Father was driving into the church, into the church sheds in Malone. The sheds were one long, low building all around the four sides of the square. You drove into the square through a gate. Every man who belonged to the church paid rent for a shed according to his means, and Father had the best one. What do you think that means, according to his means? Based on what he could afford, that's what it means. Uh, based on how much money you had. So if you were very poor, you went into the shed and you paid a very little rent. But if you had a lot of money, like Amonzo's family did, his father was very wealthy, then you went into the shed and you paid more money for your horses to stable there. And I lost my place. It was so large, the shed, that he drove inside it to unhitch and there was a manger with feed boxes and space for hay and oats. And of course, the people who paid more to stable their horses got the better places. Just like you would say you went to a concert and you wanted to sit in the front row you would pay more for your tickets than somebody who was sitting way, way up in the bleachers very far away. They would pay a very little amount for their ticket. You would pay a great deal for your ticket because your front row seats would probably cost you, depending on who you were seeing, they might cost you as much as, as three or $400 a seat. But if you were up here in what people call the nosebleed section, so if you were way up far away, not on the floor in the chairs, but up in the bleachers, way, way up high, you might only pay 50 or $60 for your seat. But you would get a seat according to your means, according to what you paid. Father let Almanzo help put blankets on the horses while mother and the girls shook out their skirts and smoothed their ribbons. Then they all walked sedately into the church. Sedately means calmly and slowly and with respect. The first clang of the bell rang out when they were on the steps. And after, there, after that, there was nothing to do but sit still till the sermon was over. It was two hours long. Elmonzo's legs ached and his jaw wanted to yawn, but he dared not yawn or fidget. He must sit perfectly still and never take his eyes from the preacher's solemn face and his wagging beard. Almanzo couldn't understand how Father knew that he wasn't looking at the preacher if Father was looking at the preacher himself. But Father always did know. At last, it was over. In the sunshine outside the church, Almanzo felt better. Boys must not run or laugh or talk loudly on Sunday. But they could talk quietly, and Almanzo's cousin Frank was there. Frank's father was Uncle Wesley. He owned the potato starch mill and lived in town. He did not want to have a farm. So Frank was only a town boy, and he played with town boys. But this Sunday morning, he was wearing a store bought cap. It was made of plaid cloth, machine woven, and it had ear flaps that buttoned under the chin. Frank unbuttoned them. So I have one of those. I wear it outside in the morning. Hold on. I'll show you what it looks like. It looks like this. It's a store-bought cloth. It's plaid. Mine actually is plaid, too. And these ear flaps, they button. I don't know if I can put it on with my headset. They button underneath my chin. I can't very well. They button under here. 
if I didn't have my headset on. But the cool thing is they also, where's the button? Oh, well, mine don't do that. Do they? No, mine aren't as cool as, as Frank's. Frank's is more cool than mine. Because we're going to find out something neat about Frank's. They button under the chin. But Frank unbuttoned them and showed Almanzo that they would turn up and button across the top of the cap. Oh, you know what? I know what you, I know mine does mine does that too. Not as cool as his probably. But mine so you can you can bring them up to the top and you can snap them on top so that you don't have ear flaps anymore. See how they button up here on the top? That's what he's talking about. Ow. That hurt. He said that the cap came from New York City. His father had brought it in Mr. Case's store. Almanzo had never seen a cap like that, and he wanted one. Royal said it was a silly cap. He said to Frank, what's the sense of ear flaps that button over the top? Nobody has ears on top of his head. So Almanzo knew that Royal wanted a cap like that, too. How do you think he knew that? <clears throat> yeah, because... For Royal says, oh, that's silly. And he's making reasons why it's so silly. And that tells Elmanzo, oh, he's really jealous. He wants that cap too. How much did it cost? Elmanzo asked. 50 cents, Frank said proudly. Elmanzo knew that he could not have one. The caps that mother made were snug and warm, and it would be foolish waste of money to buy a cap. 50 cents was a lot of money. You ought to see our horses, he said to Frank. Ha. Huh. They're not your horses, Frank said. They're your father's horses. You haven't got a horse or even a colt. I'm going to have a colt, said Almanzo. When, asked Frank. Just then, Eliza Jane called over her shoulder. Come, Almanzo, father's hitching up. He hurried away after Eliza Jane, but Frank called after him low. You are not either going to have a coat. Frank got soberly, Almanzo, I'm sorry, got soberly on the sleigh. He wondered if he would ever be big enough to have anything he wanted. <clears throat> when he was younger, father sometimes let, <clears throat> excuse me. I need some water. When he was younger, father sometimes let him hold the ends of the reins while father drove, but he was not a baby now. He wanted to drive the horses himself. Father allowed him to brush and curry comb and rub down the gentle old workhorses and to drive them on the harrow. But he could not even go into the stalls with the spirited driving horses or the colts. He hardly dared stroke their soft noses through the bars and scratch a little on their foreheads under their forelocks. Father said, you boys keep away from these colts. In five minutes, you can teach them tricks. It will take me months to gentle out of them. He felt a little better when he sat down on a good, to a good Sunday dinner. Mother sliced the hot Ryan engine bread on the bread board by her plate. Father's spoon cut deep into the chicken pie. He scooped out big pieces of thick crust, and he turned up their fluffy yellow undersides on the plate. He poured gravy over them. He dipped up big pieces of tender chicken, dark meat, and white meat sliding from the bones. He added a mound of baked beans and topped it with a quivering slice of fat pork. At the edge of the plate, he piled dark red beet pickles. As he handed the plate to El and he handed the plate to Elmanzo. Silently, Elmanzo ate it all, and then he ate a piece of pumpkin pie, and he felt very full inside. But he ate a piece of apple pie with cheese. After dinner, Eliza Jane and Alice did the dishes. But father and mother and Royal and Almanzo did nothing at all. The whole afternoon, they sat in the drowsy, warm dining room. Mother read the Bible and Eliza Jane read a book. And father's head nodded till he woke with a jerk. And then it began to nod again. Royal fingered the wooden chain that he could not whittle. And Alice looked for a long time out of the window. But Almanzo just sat. He had to. He was not allowed to do anything else, for Sunday was not a day for working or playing. It was a day for going to church and for sitting still. Elmanzo was glad when it was time to finally do the chores. 
Okay, we talked about the phrase, according to his means. Do you remember what that means? Yes, it means according to how much money you have, based on what you're able to afford. And what does it say about Father that he has the largest shed at the church? He's probably the wealthiest man at their church, or maybe even in the whole town. Why do you think Father's boy... Sorry. Why do you think Farmer Boy includes so many detailed descriptions of food? Why do you think they do that? Did you notice that? They talk about food all the time. Why do they talk about food all the time? Because it's so very different than what we eat. And they want us to understand that food was a very big part of life back then. You ate to survive. You didn't you didn't just eat because it was time. You ate because that was the only way that you could actually survive. Why are What are Almanzo's thoughts about his cousin Frank's store-bought cap? What are Almanzo's thoughts about it? Oh, yeah, he really wants one, doesn't he? He wants a cap just like this. And what does Royal say? Bye, he says it's silly. Nobody has ears on top of their head. Why would you put the ear flap there? Right? So based on what Royal says, Almanzo knows that he really wants a cap like that too, doesn't he? Think about the way in which they trap that the Wilders traveled. How did they travel? They traveled by sleigh, by horse sleigh. Mm -hmm. How is that different than the way that we travel today? Exactly. Most of us do not travel by horse and buggy or horse and sleigh, unless we're Amish, then, I mean, you would. But if you're Amish, you wouldn't be watching this video either. I mean, there's that. But that's neither here nor there. Most of us travel by car or by, by bus or um, Uber or cab or even by bicycle. We, ha we travel in a different way than they traveled back then. Most of us do not have horses hitched around out back. When I leave for the day, I don't go unhitch my horses and jump on into my horse buggy and ride on home. No, I unlock the door to my car and I get in and I turn it on and I drive home. So we travel very different ways than they did back there. All right, let's go ahead and take some notes. Write your name. The date, excuse me, today's date is 3 2 21. Mm. I needed another drink. The lesson is chapter 8. Remember when we start taking notes. You need to be sitting with your blocks stacked. Both of your feet are on the floor. Both of your hands are on your desk. Your paper is tilted slightly to the right if you're right-handed, slightly to the left if you're left-handed. Okay, let's do something different at this point. Let's go ahead and list out the major characters in Farmer Boy. A major character is one of the main people that the story is about. So who is the major character of Farmer Boy? Who is Farmer Boy? It's Elmanzo. Let's write major characters as a heading. Major, M-A-J, or characters. Major characters. Let's go ahead and underline that. Elmanzo is a major character for sure. Elmanzo. Elmanzo. Who else is a major character in this story? The whole Wilder family, aren't they? I'm just we're just gonna write the Wilder family. The Wilder family. 
And remember, Wilder is a proper noun, so we do have to use an uppercase W. The Wilder family. Okay, and there's a lot of minor characters in this story. So that's the next thing we're going to do, minor characters. We are not going to list them all. There's far too many to list. <clears throat> so the minor characters, and I'm putting a colon behind mine. Let me show you, show you what I'm doing. <clears throat> that's how I'm putting my headings in there. Major characters, minor characters. Well, let's think about it. Who is one of the minor characters that we read about a few stories back? The teacher, Mr. Course. He is a minor character in this book, Mr. Course. Who else? Well, we have the two Frenchmen, Joe and what is his name? French Joe and what's the other guy's name? <clears throat> hmm. French Joe and something John. Lazy John. That was his name. Lazy John. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and write that down. Lay Z using y I E John. French Joe. And we have Mr. Course. Who else is a <clears throat> minor? <clears throat> wow, I don't know what's going on with my throat today. <clears throat> Who else is a minor character that we just met in our last chapter, in chapter eight? Frank, you got it. Frank is another minor character. Frank, F, R, A, K, using Frank. And that's pretty much it for our minor characters, isn't it, so far? I mean, there's a lot like the Hard Scrabble Gang and um, some of the kids at school. And of course, the preacher. Those are all very, very minor characters. But they're, they're, we only are going to write down these four Mr. Course, Lazy John, French Joe, and Frank. All right, the next thing that we're going to write down is the setting. So far in this chapter, well, actually the entire book, what is the setting of the book? Remember the setting is where does the story take place? When and where does the story take place? Well, we learned in our checkpoint last week, the story is taking place in New York. It's taking place in upstate New York. So New York is the where, and remember it's, going to be uppercase N and an uppercase Y because it's a uh, proper noun, New York. The setting is New York in the late 1800s is what we're going to put. In late, it's prior to the Civil War, the late 1800s. So I guess it's probably mid 1800s, but we're going to put late 1800s, 1800, comma, apostrophe, the late 1800s. That's the when and the where. That's the setting. New York, the late 1800s. All right, and I want you to be thinking about, so far we have one more chapter that we're gonna cover this week. And then on Thursday, we're gonna do a, a quick little element of literature for Farmer Boy. And so I want you to be thinking about the chapters that we've read so far and be thinking about which one of these chapters is really my favorite. Which one of these is really my favorite chapter? Okay, that's all I got for you today. Let's go ahead and shut it down. And we'll be back tomorrow with chapter nine. Have a great day, guys. Bye.